Shay. Tua. Yila. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained and is voted by my supporters on Patreon in this week's poll. Today, we're gonna to be exploring the 2012 sci-fi action flick, Looper, directed by Ryan Johnson, starring Emily Blunt, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Bruce Willis. Now, time travel movies can sometimes become convoluted and hard to follow, thanks to all those time travel paradoxes. It takes either masterful writing or a cop-out to make sure the audience can enjoy the story and follow along without getting bogged down by complicated logistics. Looper writer and director Ryan Johnson understands that a time travel movie can be engaging without a complicated time travel rulebook, and he certainly achieves it with this movie. As Bruce Willis's character aptly puts it, I don't want to talk about time travel shit. Because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. But as I'll explore in the end, this was my biggest problem with the film, as its foundation is built on something that doesn't make any logical sense. Where have I seen something similar? But more on that later. Sure, there are films like 2004's Primer, which are fun because they focus on the complicated logic of time travel, but Looper chooses to focus more on its characters and the themes of reckoning with your own past and your own future. It asks questions like, is changing the past worth it? What makes a man evil? Turns out losing a significant member of their family will just about do it. How strong are family bonds? It even tackles a classic thought experiment of, if you could go back in time and kill a monster when they're a baby, would you? As it turns out, Bruce Willis would. It gives the audience just enough information to follow along without getting confused, but also leaves just enough of it open-ended so that the theory junkies can get their kicks too. A lot of folks will go into the movie expecting a lot of raw action, but surprisingly, the film's got quite a bit of pathos and works quite well as a character study. There's some family drama involved, and it even throws in the element of telekinesis, likely inspired by the anime film Akira, which Johnson lists as one of his influences. So, within the universe of Looper, in the year 2074, time travel is invented and then immediately made illegal, and the only people who use it are mafia bosses looking to execute clean hits. By throwing their targets 30 years into the past before time travel is invented, dead bodies can't pile up in their timeline, and they effectively erase all evidence of the crimes. The hitmen who kill these future people are referred to as Loopers, and our hero Joe is one of those guys. In addition to time travel, as mentioned earlier, about 10% of the population have developed a genetic mutation that gives them telekinetic powers. Though, as Joe explains, it isn't very powerful, and the most he's ever seen anyone do is levitate a quarter. Joe is played by both Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis, Willis playing the older version of Joe, and Gordon-Levitt playing the younger version. Now, if I were to pick someone to play young Bruce Willis, admittedly, Joseph is not the first actor that comes to mind. I mean, the dude doesn't even look like Willis in real life, but Gordon Levitt pulls it off really well. Thanks to the movie magic from makeup artist Kazuhiro Suji and hours of prosthetic work applied every morning, the actor's face morphs into one that could believably belong to a young Willis. In addition to this, Levitt says that he constantly listened to audio from old Bruce Willis movies on his iPod to get a feel for his mannerisms and to capture his voice. Sometimes the prosthetics can be a little jarring if you know what Joseph normally looks like, but overall it's very believable that the two could be different versions of each other. We first meet young Joe practicing French in a field, when suddenly a man appears in front of him. Joe quickly shoots and kills him with a weapon referred to as a blunderbuss, and then moves on with his day, stopping into his favourite diner to chat up Beatrix, a waitress who is fluent in French, and afterwards he takes his silver that he earned from his hit and heads to the club to do some drugs and party like a rock star. While at the club, he learns that one of his fellow loopers has closed his loop that day. Closing the loop essentially refers to the act of killing one's oldest self. You see, loopers agree to a certain provision when they take on this lucrative job. Since time travel is so illegal, the mafia who utilize it want to erase all evidence that they used loopers to begin with. Therefore, after 30 years, the older loopers agree to be captured and sent back in time to be killed by their younger selves, thus closing their loop. Most consider the act of closing the loop as a cause for celebration. You get a big payoff and are essentially retired with the caveat of also, you know, taking a few decades off your life by killing your 2070 self. As the week goes on, Joe notices that a lot of loopers have been closing their loops lately, but for now, he has no idea why. Eventually, Seth, Joe's neurotic best friend played excellently by Twitty Paul Dano, is confronted with this loop. 
However, he lets his loop run, or lets his future self escape, which is the worst thing a looper can do. Before old Seth escapes, he tells Seth about the Rainmaker, a super powerful man from the future who's committed to finding retired loopers and closing their loops, and this is the reason why so many loops have been closed recently. Seth runs to Joe for help, and against his better judgement, Joe agrees to hide Seth. Joe then lets his friend Seth know that he's an idiot for letting his loop run. Ironic, because we the viewer know he will soon find himself in the same position. Local thugs known as Gatmen, who are tied to the future Mafia bosses, immediately descend on Joe's apartment to look for Seth. Notably, a sweaty guy called Kid Blue, who takes him to see their boss. Joe tries to play it cool, but Abe, the boss of the Gatmen, an overseer of the Loopers, sees right through him. After Abe needles Joe and threatens to take his stash of silver, Joe sells Seth out. Floor safe under the rug. Six, seven, four, two. On the other side of town, old Seth witnesses the horror of watching his own body parts disappear in real time, with the Gap Man essentially torturing young Seth, thus causing his future body to change. Defeated and frightened, old Seth gives himself up to end this horror, and he's immediately shot down with a blunderbuss. This whole arc with Seth gives us an idea of just how serious a crime it is to let your loop run, setting the stage for Joe's arc. The next hit Joe has after all this is himself. However, he notices that future him isn't bound and masked like hits usually are. Old Joe gets up to run, and when young Joe pulls the trigger, he winds up shooting him in the silver stash attached to his back. Uninjured, old Joe knocks young Joe out and gets away. Now panicked, young Joe returns home to find the Gat Men have ransacked his apartment. Kid Blue is there again, and young Joe eludes him by locking him in the same safe that he previously used to hide Seth. We then cut to future Joe's timeline, where he essentially closes his loop by killing his older self. With the big stack of cash he gets from closing his loop, Joe goes on to enjoy an early retirement, consisting of doing a ton of drugs and committing a ton of crime. Eventually, he meets the love of his life in China, after taking Abe's suggestion to move there instead of France. When it's his turn for his loop to be closed, the Gat men who come to pick him up also shoot and kill his wife, and this pushes him to fight back and jump into the past to attempt to save her from this tragic fate. Back in the other timeline, the two Joes then meet up at the diner, and this leads to a delightfully terse and mean-spirited exchange between young Joe and old Joe, as they both dunk on the other's rationales and personality. Here, old Joe explains what happened to his wife, however, his younger self points out that he can simply meet a different girl instead, rationalising that if the two never meet, she will never get shot. But this solution doesn't satisfy old Joe, because he doesn't want to lose her. Instead, he has a different solution. He will kill the Rainmaker, the one responsible for coming to close old Joe's loop in the first place. And so far, he has three possible theories as to who it might be, and he vows to simply kill all three of them to prevent the future from happening, theoretically keeping his future with his wife. Young Joe goes along with the plan and opts to stake out one of the marked kids' houses and wait for his future self to show up so he can blast himself away once the job is complete. Using a portion of the map his future self had, which marked the location of one of the kids that might grow up to be the Rainmaker, young Joe winds up at Sarah's farm, played by Emily Blunt, and learns about her and her son Sid. Turns out, Sarah initially abandoned her son and left him with her sister. When she heard that her sister was dead, she returned to the farm to care for her son once again, and it's here that young Joe begins to see many parallels between himself and Sid. You see, Joe was also abandoned by his mother, but unlike Sid, he never had a parental figure to step in to nurture him. This loneliness is what leads him to become a junkie criminal in the future, with the influence of Abe. It's also important to note that because of Sarah's extended absence, Sid doesn't believe that Sarah is actually his mother. You can't tell me what to do because you're not my mom! You're not my mom! You're a liar! You're going to get killed because you won't stop lying! And lashes out violently against her. At first, we don't know exactly how violent he is, but we do know that he's scary enough to make his mother lock herself away in his safe. Turns out, he has extremely powerful telekinesis and little control over his powers, and it actually ended up accidentally killing Sarah's sister with these same powers. All of this information confirms that he is in fact the Rainmaker. Young Joe realises this when he sees Sid levitate and murder Jesse, a gap man sent to look for young Joe. Witnessing this makes him realise that Sid really should be stopped, but he's already become too attached to him and Sarah to kill him. This shift that focuses on family drama works really well for the movie, and even though we haven't spent as much time with Sarah and Sid as we have with Joe, Ryan Johnson manages to paint their emotional struggles in an affecting way. Sarah's hardened and abrasive nature in the beginning, contrasted with a teary-eyed monologue about wanting to protect Sid, no matter what, really packs an emotional gut punch. Meanwhile, since old Joe's memories are changing to reflect young Joe's actions, he now knows that Sid is the Rainmaker. On top of that, the Gatman know that Jesse has been killed, so they're heading to the barn for revenge. 
Looking to give Sarah and Sid a means to escape, young Joe tosses Sarah the keys to Jesse's trunk and tells him to get out of there. Sarah and Sid ride off in Jesse's trunk, but as soon as they see old Joe, Sid freaks out and accidentally emits TK that flips the truck over. They run out into the field weaponless, and old Joe takes aim. Sid sends out a vicious blast of TK, lifting both old Joe and Sarah up into the air. Sid fumes, but Sarah looks him in the eye and lovingly and patiently asks him to calm down. Sid relaxes and drops them both, but old Joe still goes to shoot. Sarah instinctively steps in the line of fire, unwilling to let her son get shot. Young Joe finally gets to them, but only has his short-range blunderbuss, which will not be able to reach old Joe. He realizes exactly what will happen if old Joe shoots Sarah. Sid will essentially grow up alone and angry, leading him to become the ruthless and powerful Rainmaker. Not only will this cause misery for the world in general, it also means that old Joe will still get captured in the future, and his lover will still die. Realizing that variations of these events will happen over and over again if he does not permanently close the loop, and since he can't reach old Joe, he turns his blunderbuss inwards and shoots himself, thus erasing old Joe from existence altogether. Since Sarah still lives, the idea here is that Sid will now grow up with love and therefore not become the Rainmaker, sparing the universe a whole heap of trouble. That is, at least, the future young Joe envisions when he shoots himself. But is that actually what will happen? Sure, the threat of Old Joe is gone, and since the leader of the Gatman was murdered at the hands of Old Joe during a badass rampage, Sid and Sarah don't have to worry about them coming for revenge either. When Old Joe first tells Young Joe the rumors about the Rainmaker, one of the stories is that he saw his own mother get killed. That's prevented, right? Or is it? Isn't it possible that Sid could still accidentally kill Sarah, thus opening himself up to the same pain and loneliness? And factor in that initially, Sid considers Sarah's sister to be his true mother, and by that logic, he still watched his mother get killed, hasn't he? I couldn't stop her from getting killed. I saw it, but I couldn't stop it. I wasn't strong enough. Another one of the rumors is that he has a prosthetic jaw, presumably caused by Old Joe grazing him with a bullet during their encounter. That event still happens before Young Joe can shoot himself, so it's still possible that Sid may go forward largely unchanged. The kid is already a volatile mess, so who's to say he doesn't grow up to become the Rainmaker either way? Finally, there's the most complicated and damning evidence that Sid might still become tainted. In Old Joe's timeline, Sid must have become the Rainmaker because of something other than Old Joe. It's possible that there was some Terminator-level BS going on here. The apocalyptic future may not have been totally prevented, only delayed. Had old Joe succeeded in killing Sarah, he would have been directly responsible for his evilness. But the fact that Sid was evil in his timeline to begin with suggests that something else happens to trigger the Rainmaker's reign of terror. The point is, the ending is open-ended on purpose, leaving viewers to ponder the fate of Sid and the potential futility of young Joe's actions long after the credits roll. But if we think about it for too long, we realize that the film stumbles into the consistency paradox, which most time travel films fall victim to. I'll be going in depth on what this means in my next video on the thrilling sci-fi time travel film Predestination, tomorrow, or yesterday, depending on where in time you're watching this from. But in layman's terms, the consistency paradox proposes that going back in time to kill your past self eradicates the future timeline, creating an alternative future, which in this case means Bruce Willis never existed and can't possibly have gone back in time. And if this is true, the events of the film can't have taken place. This is exactly why Ryan Johnson wanted to nip this in the bud early on with... I don't want to talk about time travel shit. Because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. But in truth, it's just lazy writing, because it's the director's way of saying, I don't want you to think about it, because if you do, you'll see the holes in the script. With that having been said, Looper is an otherwise masterful film. And the music, especially the leitmotif contrasting both of the different futures for either Joe is hauntingly beautiful. The musical track, Her Face, breaks me every time. The song, which undergoes minor transformations as the narrative unfolds, helps tell a simple but effective story. One man unwilling to let go of someone they loved in the future, and that same person from an earlier timeline, willing to sacrifice everything for a person they also loved. It's beautifully poetic and helps give Looper the emotional resonance scarcely found in time travel action movies. That's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.